Hi guys, welcome to NeuroGal.com. I'm NeuroGal and I, I have here with me a very special guest. Uh, his name is Dr. Marone Bixen. Welcome. We're very Hi. happy to have you here. Dr. Bixen is a biomedical engineer. He obtained his undergraduate uh, degree at Johns Hopkins in biomedical engineering and then went on to pursue his PhD in biomedical engineering at Case Western. Thereafter, went on to complete a neurophysiology fellowship at the University of Birmingham Medical School in the UK. He has studied the effects of electricity on the human body, specifically the brain, and has applied this knowledge through his research toward the development of medical devices and electrical safety guidelines. His research areas include understanding neural networks underlying normal brain function, including the role of endogenous electrical fields, as well as developing new treatments for neurological diseases, including epilepsy and depression. Professor Bixen has acted as a consultant for many biomedical companies, including Medtronic and Boston Scientific, as well as government agencies such as NIH and NASA. He is the co-director of Neuro Neural Engineering at City College of New York and New York City uh, Center for Biomedical Engineering and has had multiple publications in the realm of non-invasive neuromodulation. I was wondering if you could just briefly describe for our audience what transcranial direct current stimulation is um, and how it applies. So, um, so you know, the um, TDCS or transcranial direct current stimulation, I think you can tell a lot of what it is by its name. So transcranial refers to the fact that it's non-invasive. So the electrodes are, are going somewhere on, on the head. So these are the electrodes. Uh, direct current refers to the kind of waveform or the type of energy that's being applied to these electrodes. So in this case, it's direct current, which is the kind of thing that a nine volt battery would generate. So transcranial, nine volt battery, uh, and the stimulation refers to the brain and the fact that the goal of the technology is to stimulate the brain and to change how the brain works. So transcranial direct current stimulation is the application of low intensity direct current um, non-invasively to the brain. Most of the work, as you mentioned, you know, with TDCS is looking at brain related disorders. Mm -hmm. um, so depression is a disease that we think lives in the brain. Um, pain, as you know, is, is neuropathic pain is, a, is by, by definition, if it's neuropathic, it's something that's living in the brain, um, Parkinson's and so on. So the majority of work with TDCS is aimed at these neuropsychiatric disorders that are hypothesized to result from a brain pathology. And, you know, the goal of TDCS is, is to change that, that pathology. And the physiology behind how TDCS might work, um, is it hypothesized to affect the uh, neuroplasticity in any way? Yes, I think that's, that's one idea I think that's at the core of, of how TDCS works. The TDCS is pushing current through the brain, and so you have this sort of sea of direct current flushing across the brain. And so all the neurons that are in this in this river are, are being exposed to this to this direct current, and as a result of it, they're polarizing. And as long as the direct current is on, they're they're going to stay polarized, and quite possibly for for some time afterward. Mm -hmm. um, and one hypothesis is is that by being put in this state, these neurons now become more susceptible to plasticity, more susceptible to long-term potentiation, for example. And an important distinction is that the TDCS is not producing the plasticity. It's putting them in a state where they might be considered receptive to plasticity. Mm -hmm. The plasticity comes from something else. And so, for example, when TDCS is being used for rehabilitation, um, TDCS is not being applied on its own. Uh, patients are undergoing intensive rehabilitation to try to restore, to produce neuroplasticity, to try to restore some sort of function. And the TDCS is being applied on top of that to essentially um, make that therapy more effective. And so again, the notion is that TDCS is not simply a plasticity inducer, it's more of something that modulates or enhances the brain's own ability to undergo plasticity in situations where you, where you want to produce that boost. 
Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And so how would that apply in the realm of depression? Um, and, and, you know, would you have to put a person in a state that might allow them to elevate their mood? Or would you just have to put the TDCS on and allow it to, you know, turn it on and just wait? I mean, that's a great question because if we assume that TDCS is a booster of something else that's going on, what about indications where TDCS seems to be applied on its own? Mm -hmm. So TDCS for depression, yes, you could combine it with some sort of cognitive behavioral therapy or some other form of therapy, but um, often, especially in the context of clinical trials, it's sort of applied as a monotherapy. Patients just come in and they just get TDCS and they leave. Mm -hmm. And that's often the case in the pain is with, with pain as well. And so how do you explain that based on what I just said? I think there's different, let me go back to the three, right? Yeah. There's three <laughs> things I could think of. One is what I said is wrong. Okay, that's, you know. Um, another possibility is that um, they are getting stuff. Um, that um, essentially they, just by participating in the trial, just by coming into the physician's office, um, you're having what's called a placebo effect, but that placebo effect is a real physiological change. Mm -hmm. um, a physician who does nothing can probably make people somewhat better just by seeing the patients and, and, and perhaps projecting confidence at them. And so the, if the placebo effect is real, if the placebo effect is a real physiological change in our brain, then one of our ideas is that TDCS can actually boost placebo. And it's not, I don't see that as a negative thing. I think I see that as a, as a compelling idea. Um, but the corollary of that, which is very serious, is that therefore the patient experience leading up to TDCS may have a huge effect of what TDCS does. Meaning, if you're running a multi-center clinical trial and in one center, people are very cheerful and positive and it's a nice room and the patients talk to one another and they're sharing experiences in the waiting room and it creates a buzz, mm -hmm. TDCS might have another effect versus some sort of gloomy center where where it doesn't happen so there there's there's it's one hypothesis but it would need to be tested and it needs to be sort of verified mm -hmm. the third idea is that the, the tdcs is applied on its own and it enhances the brain's ability to undergo plasticity and we're imagining in this case that the brain is stuck in some state and and that let's say a normal individual can move the brain from this bad state into a good state but that a sick individual doesn't have the ability to make this transition. They don't have the capacity to change the brain from one state uh, to another state via plasticity. And so what TDCS is doing is empowering that brain to undergo that change, to do something that a normal individual might not be able to do. So for example, um, if depression um, or neuropathic pain is the brain stuck in a particular state, the TDCS is now letting them, the, the brain already has that desire or that capacity or, or the potential to go through that transition and the TDCS is, is, is giving it the nudge to get over that hill. Mm -hmm. Everything I'm telling you now is very hand wavy, but, but there certainly is animal data and cellular data and imaging data to, to back up each one of these ideas. Right. There have been a few studies that suggest that TDCS can be helpful in cognitive enhancement for healthy individuals. What are your thoughts on that? Um, you know, I, don't, I guess I don't think I have a nutshell thought on that. <laughs> okay. I think that um, it's clear that some of these studies um, have been run very rigorously and in some of the best you know, clinical or academic centers in the world. And what they have shown is that individuals who are doing a task uh, might do that task better when it's combined with TDCS or when they're learning something, which means they're they're naturally getting better, um, TDCS can make them learn faster or, or achieve a higher level of performance. Um, that being said, there's a lot to qualify. These are these are experiments that are, are done in very sort of reductionist experimental settings and they're not particularly real world. People aren't drinking coffee and taking a call in the middle. The tasks themselves tend to be very um, 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 abstract as they need to do. So for example, if TDCS is being used to, as a to evaluation for creativity, it's not necessarily creativity the way we would look for it every day, uh, but it's looking at a shoe 
and and deciding whether it could be used as a hammer kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the caveat based on that. Um, there certainly is a lot of work um, looking at the effects of TDCS in healthy individuals as a form of performance enhancement. And like I said, a lot of it I'm, I'm very enthusiastic for, even if it requires replication. Some of it um, will not replicate and may not have been conducted as well as some of the other trials. And um, obviously now you're also seeing consumer devices and, and, and other kind of devices that are that are marketing themselves to, to fill what I guess is a, a a desire by at least some people to access this. Some people are believers because I'm assuming they're they're looking to get this technology, which is why you can see it online for these non-medical purposes. Right, right. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, do-it-yourself TDCS? There, there are a lot of different products on the market now, um, and and it's very accessible for the layperson to buy one of these devices. Um, my thoughts on this have changed a lot in the past. I've been doing this for a while, so I don't know, five, six years more. Um, I certainly used to be in the camp where I thought, um, you know, this is ours, we're the academics, TDCS is ours, okay. you know, is ours and the doctors, and we don't want people to touch it, right. no matter how much they think they could benefit from it uh, without our say-so. Um, um, but now I, I, I don't think that's necessarily the responsible even or, or ethical thing to do, and, and um, certainly not, not necessarily our right to, to make that decision. Um, uh, in the one case, you have people who are sick and they're suffering and they've run out of options. And they're and they're considering um, reaching out to their doctor to provide an off-label treatment with the technology, or or even self-medicating. And I and I um, I certainly don't don't think it's my place to tell someone to to seek or not seek out treatment when when they're really suffering or when their loved one is really suffering. Mm -hmm. um, but what I can say um, is that there are different quality of devices. There are better made devices and, there, and there's worse made devices. And the reason this matters is uh, if you're suffering from something and you read a paper that came out of, you know, this university that said TDCS uh, improved mood, right? Mm -hmm. And you're depressed. Um, if you buy a, a TDCS device, and, and, and it also says, by the way, the TDCS was tolerated, so the side effects were not severe. Mm -hmm. um, if you buy a poorly designed device or a poorly documented device, a bunch of things may happen. One is that device may not provide what it's saying it's providing. So you're not even getting uh, what you saw in the study. Um, and as a result of that, it may not have the same efficacy or it may not have the same tolerability. Um, there may have been no lasting skin irritation in the in the trial, um, but because of, because what you bought is, is not well made, it might produce a skin burn. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we need to really draw a distinction between quality equipment and and poor equipment and it's very easy for me to say i think in general um everyone researchers physicians uh, and individuals should have access to quality equipment and um there yet yet that's great but then there's some ambiguity even among researchers what is quality equipment i've heard researchers ask me whether they should go to amazon <laughs> right and get one wow. of these devices because they know so different and so um there's a bit of a campaign there about education about quality, um, and by the way, I'm not implying that any, that the the uh, um, I'm not an expert in sort of the do-yourself TDCS community. Mm -hmm. I certainly think some of them are very sophisticated, and so I'm not implying that you know they necessarily they're not um, um, they, you know they're they're not aware of the issues I'm talking about right now. Mm -hmm. um, um, but one of the things I've tried to do to be proactive in this way is we recently published a paper called the Lotus Guideline. Um, um, limited output transcranial electrical stimulation lotus guideline and this was a guideline um, that um, it, it's like uh, like my other papers it's available through my website and this guideline essentially developed the criteria that any device whether medical or consumer directed would need to meet this is an engineering standard in order to guarantee essentially quality essentially to guarantee reliability meaning you could have devices that meet the lotus and you could have devices that do not meet the Lotus. Mm -hmm. um, it's an obligated, uh, it's an obligatory standard. Um, we're not enforcing it on anybody, but certainly now um, consumers um, 
or researchers, you know, are empowered to say, okay, you're giving me this device, does it meet the Lotus, which is just one standard that we put forward where we believe that devices that meet Node Lotus are uh, meet a minimum standard of reliability. Now it turns out that the Lotus does borrow a lot from medical device standards, and so it's a high standard. We are basically saying that we think that even consumer directed devices like TDCS need to meet or at least approach medical device standards. So we set a high bar. Um, but I think this was still well received even by the, you know, the responsible consumer neuromodulation companies, mm -hmm. um, some of them which co-authored co -authored that paper. And I should also say that, that uh, any device that is medical grade, so that, for example, has a, a CE mark, um, um, would already meet these standards as well. So there's sort of, the, the, it, 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 you ask, well, what about the medical stuff? And, and research grade should be medical grade in some extent it would already meet the Lotus. So I think Lotus is sort of this broad blanket, um, but it's particularly directed towards this consumer market. Mm -hmm. I know that was a long answer to your, to your question. So, I, on, so, on the, so yeah, on the medical side, um, you know, it's between a patient and his doctor and I'm not, I'm not a physician. I'm not gonna tell people what to do or not to do. Um, but I think people have should be informed and have all the information in front of them. And that's mm -hmm. something that, you know, myself and, and, and other researchers and, and, and clinicians and obviously you are doing and just getting information out there. Um, I don't think there can be any argument mm -hmm. that we need good information out there. Absolutely. In terms of a consumer being able to get access to a medical grade device, is that possible or would they have to do it through a physician? Um, gener the, the simple answer is they would need to do it through a physician. Mm -hmm. um, it is, um, I don't know if I call it ironic, it's the, the, the companies that are making medical grade devices in the US uh, and therefore are, are prescribing to sort of these, the highest standards set by the FDA um, or as a rule not providing devices to consumers, meaning the best devices out there are not necessarily available to consumers. Um, um, but I think there are some devices that are are directed to consumers mm -hmm. um, that are are produced to, to a relatively high standard, and then there are some that that clearly are not. Um, but the, yeah, a lot of these devices. That of course there is this this middle ground um, um, of iontophoresis, right? Is 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 some devices are there are these iontophoresis devices, which have been used by the way in TDCS clinical trials in universities and academic centers. These devices provide a weak direct current uh, and are FDA cleared um, for something other than TDCS, but the hardware itself is FDA cleared, which by the way means it would meet Lotus as well. Um, um, technically, I believe um, iontophoresis is a prescription device as well, um, but they, they, um, there may be some ambiguity there as far as them being made available. And if you take an iontophoresis device um, and you change the sticker mm -hmm. so that it's a TDCS device. So it's the same bit of hardware, but one is iontophoresis and one is TDCS. Um, um, you get into even more ambiguity about how, well, now how is it regulated? And now can it be distributed directly to consumers and, and, and which standards apply to it then? And um, I, I don't think this ambiguity is a good situation for anybody. Right. I don't think it's good for, for physicians. I don't think it's good for consumers. And so I think that is something that need, this is something that needs to be corrected. Mm -hmm. uh, if the, not the FDA, um, then I think the clinical and research community should should be coming together to step forward and clarify, you know, at least how they believe these things should be should be regulated. And because um, otherwise it kind of creates these awkward situations mm -hmm. that don't make any sense. Right, yeah. right. And I myself have found um, it peculiar that you know there's there's a lot of uh, evidence that TDCS is effective in certain disorders and conditions and I would be open to uh, in utilizing it in my practice um, but the fact that the FDA hasn't really approved any devices in the US has really limited my ability um, and what I find even more ironic is that other countries have approved TDCS for use. Um, Canada, Europe, you said, um, Australia, Brazil. Um, so it's certainly, there, the evidence is there, 
but um, there are certain barriers within the U.S. that uh, uh, prevents us from helping um, people who yeah. are suffering. So why do you think that is? Why, why such barriers in the U.S.? Um, you know, the FDA has a higher standard um, or I call it a more difficult standard than you'll see elsewhere, mm -hmm. um, which is why often you'll see, in general, you'll see things approved elsewhere before they are approved here. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's a bigger argument, whether that's for better or for worse. Um, I have heard, you know, the FDA say that their mission is to ensure that Americans have access to the best therapies first. And it doesn't always seem like that mission uh, is, 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 is coming true. Um, I personally, you know, um, have, have some issue with the notion of the FDA getting between a physician and a patient. So we're not even talking you know, about consumer use here. We're just talking about someone who is sick. Uh, they're seeing a, a, a you know degreed and certified physician uh, who is responsible, who cares about their patient, and if they reach a decision about a course of treatment, um, um, it's a complicated question when the FDA should intervene, right? And you could argue, well, the FDA should intervene in situations where there might also be a risk. Except, we use TDCS on healthy college kids. TDCS is considered tolerated enough mm -hmm. um, that across psychology labs across this you know country under IRB approval you have undergraduates operating machines stimulating other undergraduates um, not to treat them but just to see what will happen to see how it changes so we have this understanding that this is an extremely a, a technique that is so well tolerated it can be tested on healthy individuals it can be sold on Amazon so so we're, we're comfortable with the risk there right so now you have a patient who is suicidal, uh, has so much pain, they can't pick up their kid, and, uh, and, and, and it's being prescribed by a doctor, and so it, it's, 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 it's this notion of, of, of um, omitting treatment and not allowing it. And again, I think uh, there has to be perhaps a collective effort to, 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 to clarify this issue. Um, you could say, oh, well, let it run its course. I mean, what, five, ten years? But and by then, a lot of these people who would want to treat now, their lives have already been ruined or, or, or they're dead. And, um, I mean, the other thing I want to add is, you know, um, you know as you know, so much of, of medications is off-label anyways. Right. Right? So, so it's, we're already comfortable with the notion that a physician can provide something off-label. Now, TDCS doesn't have any label, right? That's the problem, Right. right. Um, but I mean, a great analogy is with TMS. So our TMS, I was talking to a very, very well-known, very responsible clinician researcher uh, who um, was involved in you know, pivotal RTMS trials for depression, and then he set up a clinic, uh, you know, doing RTMS for depression. But now in his clinic, he's seeing people that, first of all, have depression, but don't meet this like super, super restrictive, I fail two drugs, but not four in this guideline that the FDA was approval for, but they're using that off label on them. But they're also treating pain and other things. And they and this clinician said, well, I'm comfortable doing that because it's off label. So then I asked him, okay, on, on Thursday, so the FDA approved it on Friday, mm -hmm. right? The FDA approved it on Friday morning. On Thursday, a patient comes to see you for RTMS for pain, and you don't want to give it to them because RTMS is not approved for pain. Friday morning, the FDA approves it for depression, which has nothing to do with pain at all. And the same patient comes yeah. back, and now you are somehow comfortable giving them the exact same thing, yet the FDA hasn't said a peep right. um, about um, about you know that particular indication, right? So so it's a bit of a conceptual thing. Okay, you can say, but what about the device itself? The device itself has to be well built. And the device itself should should meet a certain level of, of should be reliable in a certain sense, um, but that is covered by Lotus. That's covered by other standards. So if we're just saying, well, the devices should be well built, we can cover that in other ways. And so we're in this in this in this in this situation, right, where where um, um, it's to no one's benefit, you know, and and. and and even if, even if in the next few years we're going to see the the, the approval of, of TDCS for one very common indication, it's not going to be approved for 
all the other of linear of things that it might be used for off label. Mm -hmm. Right. And so is it is it so again it gets down to this like Thursday Friday argument. What mm -hmm. what what what's okay. what's okay on what's okay on Friday? Why was it not okay on Thursday? Exactly. And so in your um, in your knowledge, it, are there any physicians that you know of that are using TDCS? in their clinical practice. I know you had mentioned that uh, the, there are clinicians using RTMS um, because right. it's FDA approved. Um, so what about TDCS? Um, so you know, we could talk about internationally, of course, in the US, internationally, in, it's, a, right. it's a much easier transition, mm -hmm. but you want to- yeah, In the US. the US, yeah. It's migrating, yes, I mean, I, um, Pretty sure if you Google it, you know, maybe TDCS therapy, you'll find some providers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's some other providers, I think, that don't necessarily advertise their services, but are, but are making it available. Um, and unfortunately, you know, they, they are, I think, in some cases, operating a little bit in, in, in limbo. However, there are some physicians at some universities that have got, uh, sorry, hospitals, um, that have gone to their hospitals and have presented TDCS to those hospitals. Um, and ask for permission to to provide this as a treatment um, and have received clearance. Um, there's other physicians that have, um, um, or they're also affiliated with, let's say, a large you know medical system, um, and they've gotten these sort of blanket IRBs that essentially provide, allow them to almost treat everyone under sort of this blanket IRB kind of protocol. Um, I think for a physician at a private practice or a small clinic, um, those options aren't necessarily there, maybe you can write to your insurance and ask about it. Um, in my experience, you know, consulting for some of these people, often the barrier actually is billing more than more than anything else for as far as these medical institutions go. Um, and, and that's that's a different road. It's not the discussions people are, are, are having is not could this help people? There seems to be enough evidence to suggest it's at least worth trying mm -hmm. some situations, and, and the argument doesn't seem to be, you know, what's what are the risks? Because again, it's hard to make the risk argument mm -hmm. when you're these same institutions are stimulating healthy college kids. Right. Um, it seems to relate to these other arguments that that um, um, are, are separate from from you know what's what's what necessarily the patient wants. And mm -hmm. again, in some cases, you have situations where. The patient might be might be have the capacity and be willing to self pay, or the physician might be willing to provide the treatment for free, and yet we still have these other barriers in place. Right, right. So, um, if you were to see, if you were to predict where TDCS is in five, ten years, would you see it approved and in widespread use? Uh, you know, it's, it's, hard to to say. it's hard to say. It's hard to say. I think there's a lot of, of, of people who are who um, are doing research on TDCS and are working extremely hard um, in different indications, whether it's MS, uh, whether it's age related cognitive decline, whether it's, it's chronic pain. They're, they're working very hard to run very rigorous clinical trials or run some sort of open label validation um, to prove that it's working. And and I think it'd be really um, unfortunate if in five years we're in a situation where we're sort of starting the next round of trials, mm -hmm. and we're, and that's essentially you know and we've sort of we've sort of spun our wheels this sort of this sort of clinical trial wheels and and do the trial get funding do trials get the funding and, and so on I I, um, I really hope um, that um, um, what 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 now is really nascent deployment as far as you know clinical treatment um, is somewhere else in five years um, but I know as we're just talking about I see that there could be a lot of barriers to that and again not all not not the, the, the hardest ones I see now don't necessarily seem to be related to sort of a risk benefit um, decision that physician t can make they seem to be related to other factors mm -hmm. um, you know there's no uh, yeah so one can hope, yeah. you know, because again, you're, you're, it's not an abstract thing. You're talking about people who are really suffering. You're talking about old people. You're talking about children. You're talking about all types of people who are really suffering. And um, if you believe the, some of the clinical trials, if you believe some of the anecdotes that are coming from, from, from extremely conservative, very well-respected clinicians in different domains, not everyone, not 100%, but some people, 
right, mm -hmm. um, can benefit tremendously from this technology. And, and so how long um, it, does there need to be a barrier just in the US, mm -hmm. you know, preventing access? Right. Separately from that, though, I, I would also say, you know, thinking five years, um, I, I don't think we've done a lot. I think we failed, uh, you know, uh, uh, on the research and, and clinical research side to be innovative. I think the TDCS that we're doing today is a lot like the TDCS that was done um, almost 20 years ago. Two milliamp, 20 minutes, when you on to 20 minutes, um, often with you know these large sponges. And so I would hope that in five years, what we see is, is um, the TDCS looks different than it looks now. Uh, it's more deployable, it's more modern, it's more targeted, it incorporates sensors on board. Um, I think we can do so much more with, with, with TDCS um, and I think as that is done, hopefully the, the deployment and the access might these things might go up, might sort of go up together. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 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 Well, so so I guess on on that on a slightly separate note, um, you know, it's obvious that it's effective, and there are people who are buying these devices online to try to ameliorate whatever is alien aliening them. Um, how how would you recommend, um, I guess, spreading awareness and and actually spreading uh, accurate education about how to how to accurately use TDCS? Are there any resources or any are there any conferences that lay people could attend, or even clinicians that may consider using TDCS in the future? Um. So certainly as far as you know, general education, I think there's a lot of things to debate, but that's the one that we can all agree on, but let's get the information out there. Mm -hmm. um, conferences are one of them. Um, I run, uh, I co-chair a conference myself, it's called NYC Neuromodulation, um, and it's gonna be run um, at the end of August, this August, August 2018 in New York City, in conjunction with another organization called the North American Neuromodulation Society, NANS. Mm -hmm. That meeting is certainly open to the public. It's open to anybody who's interested in, um, in um, neuromodulation. Those, it will be heavily you know, clinicians and researchers. Um, and that conference does include hands-on courses uh, in TDCS as well. Um, so obviously you have the, the, the clinical trials and the human trials that, you know, that are published online uh, and people can go ahead and access those um, and they should read them, but um, just like we read them with a grain of salt, they should read them with a grain of salt. Um, not everything is, re is, is reproducible, the negative, you know, there's, and, and, and so on. Um, um, you know, there's also, obviously with some of the more exciting trials, you get the media pickup. Um, I found that when media picks up generally stuff related to the brain and that includes TDCS, the headlines may not necessarily reflect the the, the the you know the meat that was in the trial itself. So that's certainly a point of caution. Um, um, so people need to, to be a little bit careful about that. Um, um, and and uh, and again, what you're doing, I think, what what other sort of people, responsible um, bloggers, communicators, journalists are doing to, to get to get information out there. Um, um, because I think there 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 are, there may be some. Um, that pointing in anybody in particular, you know, there may be places where there is inaccurate information or where people are being guided to do things that, that are not wise or, or not recommended. Right. Um, or using devices that do, don't fulfill the Lotus criteria standards. Right, right. Yeah. right. And, and again, I'm not, I want to be careful. I don't, I don't want to suggest that devices must. And I'm not mm -hmm. suggesting that devices that don't meet the Lotus criteria are necessarily hazardous. I'm mm -hmm. just saying that now we do have a line in the sand. Mm -hmm. And so some devices are going to be on the other side of that of that line. And that is one criteria, just that is one criteria that people should use, um, um, uh, you know, when, when uh, that including, you know, clinicians, researchers, individuals should, should certainly use when, when making a decision. Absolutely. Well, well, thank you. Um, I guess my final question for you is, do you have any additional important thoughts that we haven't covered yet regarding TDCS? Uh, <laughs> um, things that we haven't, I mean, um, you know, I can, you know, one, one thing that, that's coming up that's kind of timely right now is that as with any field that gets a lot of traction like TDCS, there has been pushback every now and then. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very healthy. 
uh, when it's when it's done appropriately. Um, um, there have been you know some meta analysis, for example, that have suggested that um, TDCS works for nothing. And I think that th that makes as little sense, you know, saying TDCS works for everything. We need to be very careful. TDCS is not one thing. And it's quite possible that TDCS was run at this medical center with this group of population, with this dose and this number of sessions, and they saw an effect. And TDCS was run with a different electrode montage for a different current under different conditions combined with a different intervention in, in another place, and they saw a different effect. And I, I wouldn't put those two things together and say, well, a net average, it looks like nothing or it, it's ambiguous or something. TDCS is not one thing. And so it, it, I think I see it's a very common mistake in these sort of meta analyses or these attempts to collapse things together to assume that it's, 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 it's one thing. It'd be like saying, I want to do a meta analysis of drugs for depression. Mm -hmm. All drugs. What are you talking about? It's not one. So that's, you know, that's certainly one point of qualification. Another um recent debate that's come up has to do with you know whether tdcs is too low intensity whether because it's just a few milliamp and because only some of those milliamp will get into the brain uh therefore it's not high intensity therefore um, it's not going to work and again i think that's there's great mechanistic questions remaining about tdcs but one thing that is not a question is that it's low intensity we have always known that tdcs is low intensity we have known for a decade uh, that only a fraction gets into the brain, and we've, we've been quantifying how much that is. Um, and how we think TDCS works as a modulator, not as an inducer of plasticity, but as a modulator of TDCS, requires sort of a small polarization effect. It doesn't make neurons fire. It just makes them polarize. So that's another thing that's come up as well. I have um, you know, a good colleague named Sven Bestman, and he, you know, he basically says, look, Hype either way is hype. So I think we need to be very careful about the positive hype with TDCS. I mentioned that with some of these headlines. Mm -hmm. um, I think we also be, it's equally, I think, knee jerk and unscientific to, to go for this negative hype as well. Um, there's a lot of information out there and, and you know, um, the good literature, hopefully discussions like we're having now are constructive and kind of, kind of separating out um, where there's value and, and where there's noise. Yeah, yeah. So important not to throw the baby out with bath, the, the bath water, exactly. right? Yep. Well, great. Well, that's exactly. very, very helpful, very um, informative. I really appreciate you coming on today. Thank you. I, yep. I really appreciate the questions yep. and, the, and the opportunity to chat with you. Absolutely. And then hopefully um, I am planning on joining you um, at the conference uh, in August, right? The New York City yep. Neuromodulation Conference. Um, NYC Neuromodulation NANS, if anybody else is interested, just, just Google yep. NYC, N-A-N-S, it's easy to find. Um, and the conference has sold out in past years uh, and space is limited. So I would ask if you, if you do want to come and you don't want to be disappointed, um, register right away. And I'll put the link uh, from your website, uh, neuromodic.com. I'll, I'll put that link. Um, in my blog post so that, um, and then it also has a, a little, your, your website has a link to the conference, right? Where you could sign up. Right, so neuromodic.com will list, will, will have a prominent link to that event as well. Mm -hmm. And um, other educational opportunities, other conferences um, in neuromodulation and related to TDCS. And so um, it's, yes, and I, I would encourage people to, to, to look at other events as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Bixson. I appreciate you coming on. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks okay. a lot. Take care.